Is a city on the moon possible? We know that NASA wants to establish a base on the moon for research or even mining, but what I'm talking about is a real colony, a second home on another celestial body, where humans can live comfortably and actually call it home. Companies like SpaceX are already dreaming of building a colony on Mars, and if we're serious about doing that, then building a city on the moon should be easier to reach. So let's answer that question today. What would it take to colonize the moon? And more importantly, what would it be like? To be fair, Elon Musk does want to go to the moon too, but so far he's mostly seen it as a stepping stone or a really cool thing you could do before going to Mars. Musk estimates that it would take around a million tons of supplies to build a self-sustaining city on Mars. For the moon, we'd likely need far less. And even if it did take a million tons, getting that material to the moon would be a lot faster to do since we don't have to wait for two-year launch windows and the moon is so much closer. Again, I'm not saying colonizing the moon is easy, just that compared to colonizing Mars, it sounds a lot more achievable. So let's say we did want to colonize the moon. There are some basic needs that moon colonists would have to take care of if this were going to be any kind of long-term living arrangement. First up, shelters, or in other words, a moon base. The surface infrastructure of a base could include things like pre-integrated landers used as support stations for robotic rovers, habitation modules for a crude presence, or even structures built on the surface using materials brought from Earth or made on the moon itself. Lunar bases might also work together with lunar space stations. Those would orbit the moon and provide support for operations, like NASA's planned Lunar Gateway in the Artemis program. There have been many ideas proposed for how to establish moon bases, but now that SpaceX's Starship could potentially land humans on the moon, one especially cool idea is to actually use the Starship itself as part of the base once it's there. The concept involves repurposing the large volume and structure of its empty fuel tanks to create robust habitats. In theory, this could result in a permanent moon base with about 2.5 times the habitable volume of the International Space Station. Pretty insane to think about to be honest. We'd also need to cover our base with lunar regolith, which is basically moon dust and soil. That's because on the moon, temperatures swing wildly. At night, it can drop to negative 175 degrees Celsius, and during the day, it can shoot up to plus 126 degrees Celsius. A thick layer of regolith would act like insulation to help manage those extremes. Plus, it would also serve as a shield against the thousands of ping-pong ball-sized meteorites that hit the moon's surface every day. This option wouldn't just simplify the process, it would also make expanding the base a lot easier. The only thing is, our future moon colony might end up looking a bit like a trailer park made of SpaceX starships. Once we've secured a place to live, the next critical priority is water. Water is essential not only for drinking and growing food, but also as a source of hydrogen and oxygen, which can be split and used as rocket fuel, supporting future exploration and long-term lunar habitation. Ideally, we should source as much of it as possible directly from the moon. While early missions may carry some water from Earth, the cost of transporting it is staggering, around $50,000 per pound. Since one gallon of water weighs about eight pounds, that adds up to $400,000 per gallon just to get it to the lunar surface. At those prices, it's essential to bring as little as possible and focus on producing or extracting water on the moon itself. Obtaining breathable air in the form of oxygen is relatively straightforward on the moon. Lunar soil, or regolith, contains oxygen that can be extracted using heat and electricity. Water, however, is a more complex challenge. There is growing evidence that water ice may exist beneath the surface, particularly at the moon's south pole, where it has likely accumulated in permanently shadowed craters. If confirmed, this buried ice could potentially be mined, offering a local source of water that would address several critical needs. NASA scientists have also discovered that water may be formed through interactions between the moon and the solar wind, a stream of charged particles emitted by the sun. When these high-speed protons, traveling at around 450 kilometers per second, strike the lunar surface, they interact with electrons in the regolith to form hydrogen atoms. These hydrogen atoms then bond with oxygen atoms already present in the soil, particularly those bound in silica, psi, and other oxygen-rich minerals. The result is the formation of hydroxyl, OH, a key component of water, H2O. This process suggests that any exposed silica-rich surface in space, from the moon to tiny dust grains, has the potential to act as a micro-scale water factory.
If water turns out to be scarce or inaccessible on the moon, it may need to be imported from Earth. One cost-effective approach could be to transport liquid hydrogen from Earth and combine it with oxygen extracted from the moon's soil to produce water. Since water is approximately 67% oxygen and 33% hydrogen by weight, this method minimizes the amount of mass that needs to be launched from Earth, significantly reducing costs. An added benefit is that hydrogen and oxygen can be used in a fuel cell, generating electricity as they react to form water. This dual-purpose approach could provide both power and a vital life support resource for lunar missions. Food is another major challenge for lunar colonization. On average, one person consumes about 200 kilograms, 450 pounds of dehydrated food per year. A full colony would require tons of food, making long-term resupply from Earth both expensive and unsustainable. Naturally, the first idea is to grow food on the moon, a solution that works well on Earth because essential elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are freely available in the atmosphere and soil. But on the moon, these elements are not readily accessible. To grow a ton of wheat, for example, you'd need to supply significant amounts of carbon, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and other nutrients, many of which would have to be imported initially. Once a closed-loop system is established and the colony's population stabilizes, these nutrients can be recycled naturally. Plants are eaten by people who then excrete waste products, solid, liquid, and gaseous, like CO2, that can be processed and returned to the soil to nourish the next generation of crops. However, getting to that point still requires importing a large initial stock of nutrients or food to seed the cycle. But what about growing plants directly in lunar regolith, the dusty, nutrient-poor soil found on the moon? Surprisingly, the answer is yes. In a groundbreaking experiment, scientists at the University of Florida successfully grew Arabidopsis thaliana in lunar soil. This small flowering plant, native to Eurasia and Africa, is part of the same family as mustard greens, broccoli, and Brussels sprouts. It's also one of the most studied organisms in plant biology, making it ideal for research in extreme conditions. The team used actual lunar soil collected during the Apollo 11, 12, and 17 missions, allotting just one gram of regolith per plant. After adding water and seeds, they placed the trays into sealed terrariums and added a nutrient solution daily. After two days, they actually started to sprout. However, over time, the researchers observed that plants grown in lunar soil were less robust than those grown in Earth soil or even a lunar simulant made from volcanic ash. Growth varied depending on which Apollo mission the soil came from, and plants showed stunted roots and slower development. Despite these challenges, the experiment proved that plants can grow in lunar regolith, opening up a wide range of new questions. Which genes help plants adapt to lunar soil? Can we modify plants or soil conditions to reduce stress and improve growth? Are some regions of the moon more suitable for agriculture than others? A lot of things make the moon more interesting and worth exploring. Of course, we can't do anything without power. It might eventually be possible to manufacture solar cells on the moon, but sunlight is only available part of the time, depending on the location. As mentioned earlier, hydrogen and oxygen can react in a fuel cell to generate electricity, an option that also produces water as a byproduct. Nuclear power is another promising option, especially using uranium that could potentially be mined on the moon. NASA is currently wrapping up the initial phase of its fission surface power project, which focuses on developing concept designs for a small electricity-generating nuclear fission reactor. The goal is to deploy it during a future moon mission and to use the findings to guide future systems for Mars. The proposed reactor would weigh under six metric tons and generate 40 kilowatts of electrical power, enough for demonstration purposes and to support lunar habitats, rovers, backup systems, and scientific experiments. For perspective, 40 kilowatts is roughly the average power needed to supply 33 households in the U.S. Crucially, the system is designed to operate for up to a decade without human intervention, which would make it an ideal solution for long-term lunar missions. However, the real game-changer for energy, both on the Moon and Earth, 
could be the production of nuclear power using helium-3. Helium-3 is carried by the solar wind, which reaches both the Earth and the Moon. On Earth, however, it does not accumulate in significant amounts, making it virtually impossible to recover. But on the Moon, it is a different story. The lunar regolith, which is incredibly old, with some of it over a hundred million years old, has had plenty of time to collect helium-3 particles deposited by the solar wind. While still present in small quantities, it is concentrated enough on the moon that mining and transporting it back to Earth could become a viable option. The major advantage of helium-3 as a fuel for nuclear fusion is that it produces no radioactive waste, which is a huge breakthrough. If we can harness nuclear power without the burden of dangerous byproducts, we could provide virtually unlimited clean energy for both lunar colonies and Earth. After all the basic requirements are met, we can turn our attention to other essentials, such as communications. This will be key not only for sending and receiving vital information, but also for maintaining mental health. If we are going to live on the moon for an extended period, we do not want to feel lonely or disconnected from Earth. People will still need to video call friends and family back home. This is where systems like Starlink come in. Reliable, high-bandwidth satellite internet could play a major role in keeping a lunar settlement connected to Earth. And there are several ways that a lunar settlement could benefit humanity. One is by providing energy for people on Earth. There are a couple of options here. For example, solar power satellites stationed on or near the moon could beam energy back to remote areas on Earth that lack reliable power. Another option, as mentioned earlier, is mining helium-3 for use in future fusion reactors. While fusion technology is not yet fully viable, helium-3 offers long-term potential. In the worst-case scenario, the moon could play an even more critical role. The biggest reason for building a lunar settlement may be the possibility that Earth becomes uninhabitable. This could happen due to worsening climate change or the outbreak of a global nuclear conflict. In such a scenario, it is possible that life on Earth could no longer continue. At the very least, a self-sustaining lunar base could help preserve the knowledge, culture, and progress of Earth civilization and ensure that humanity continues even if Earth does not.